Hey guys, what's going on? Uh, just got out of class, and you know, it's science classes. I'm always trying to learn a little more. Uh, but today, the professor said something that was really interesting. And he was talking about uh, science philosophy, right? Well, he mentions that uh, there's two different kind of schools, two different kind of, kind of ways of science philosophy. Uh, one is a European view, one's an American view, and I think this is pretty applicable to flat earth. So he says the European view is all about the truth and finding the truth and you know what actually is the 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 truth behind it you know um so we're talking about you know when you're developing a theory to explain a happening and a, a phenomenon so they're interested in actually what is the actual true how can we actually explain this phenomenon and he says the American way is not about finding the truth, but about creating a theory that works. Okay. Wow. Um, and then if that theory doesn't work, then he's saying, uh, then what you do is you create another theory. You create a different theory. So uh, this sounds exactly like globe theory to me globe theory flat earth theory is that oh well yeah well the globe theory works so it doesn't matter if it's true or not because it works the globe theory works and they think they believe that it works inside their head because they haven't done the research to kind of defraud the theory uh, to contend against the theory now Another interesting thing that I saw, um, and this was a feature on something, a feature on a website that I had previously used quite a bit. Uh, and the thing, excuse me, the thing is a periodic table. So what this is, is a website that has the periodic table. Okay, well, that's not very interesting. Or is it? The website is P table. So, you know, very simply, it's just a uh, abbreviation of periodic table, ptable.com. Uh, pretty, pretty neat thing. Taking a high speed turn here, so gonna have to hold the camera. But, uh, so one thing that I had noticed is there's a slider on that. Uh, it's about, it's about above the, uh, above the fifth or sixth row over there on the uh, on the top so now what's what's interesting about this let's let's go over this uh, what I found interesting about the slider is that it seemed to really support my view on satellites and the reasons that I think satellites are uh, difficult to difficult to explain in the solar system model that they have given. In the model where they describe the satellites and the different altitudes that the satellites fly on or orbit on, it just doesn't make sense for the altitude that they say it at because at that altitude, the temperatures are very, very high. Um, you know, there's an idea that, th there's a response to this, a contention saying that, oh, well, you know, it's in space. And, you know, I've pointed out before that, hey, NASA even says that space heat is more of a concern because there is no air to dissipate the heat. <laughs> so explain to me it by just saying space and saying that it's a vacuum. That doesn't explain it, guys. Um, now, what's interesting about this is that this P-table slider really supports my position. And how it supports it is this. Well, 
I long contended, I said, 3,000 degrees Kelvin, you know, how can, how can the satellite be there, much less how can the satellite have all of these uh, very sensitive electronics and equipment. You know, we're talking camera and electronics with rubber seals and gaskets. I mean, we're not just talking high temperature, we're talking high temperature, low temperatures. It's like extremes in the desert. You go from scun burning in the sunlight to freezing in the, in the sun dark, in the shade. Um, so how can a piece of rubber or some kind of insulation go from positive 3,000 to negative, I don't know, what, 1,500? Um, I'm not sure of the negative numbers. I just, I just know that it was the uh, deep geostationary ones, the ones that hover like the DSC OVR at a set... Okay, it's the geostationary, the ones that uh, rotate directly over a piece of land and do not move over that piece of land. So those are like at what, 36,000 kilometers? Or three, I don't, um, I may be off on my numbers right now, but the altitude at which those geostationary ones orbit have a temperature of 3,000 degrees Kelvin. Okay, so I took the slider on P-table and sliding it to the right, and I noticed that that's for temperatures. Okay. It actually even changes the color scheme of that table. So what it does is it takes a uh, normal color scheme of the table, will have the different chemicals by their different traits, you know, the transient metals or the noble gases or this and that. So it's by the type of element that it is. Now when you do that slider, and just as you're moving the slider and looking at that temperature, it changes into black, red, and blue, saying, is it a solid, a liquid, or a gas? And you pull it up to 3,000, and pretty much every element is a gas at that point, even the metals. So what can you make? A, I mean, I'll go back through it. I'm going to look at it. But there's just not that many elements that would reside in its natural state at 3000 Kelvin in order to be able to create a functioning satellite with these internal electronics. Uh, I would even go so far as to say that even when you take a portion of that, even when you're looking at only a third of that, let's say, I haven't really looked at a thousand Kelvin, but just look at a thousand Kelvin and see what states those metals and insulations and, hey, look at silicon and quartz and all that other stuff. Uh, look at the main components of electronics and circuitry and circuit boards and see if those are realistic in that temperature range. I don't think they are, but that's just me. Um, so it's just, you know, just a day at school. What has it learned you? What have you learned today? Kind of thing. If you don't, uh, you don't take the opportunity and always try to learn and always try to expand your consciousness and expand the way things are talking. Right? Things are explain. If you don't expand the way that you think about things, then you are never going to learn. Um, it's not just about learning new things, it's about kind of re-understanding old things. Example, um, in one of my evolution classes, which I think is gonna be really fun because I'm, I'm not a big proponent of evolution. Uh, I think evolution is very subjective, meaning, okay, at what point are you going to say, hey, you know, this is evolution, or this is just kind of the change of the species. So, at what point does it become another species? And they say, you know, one of my questions is, have we ever seen and ever can document what exactly evolution has done to a species? Have we seen the change? Now, is a, is a bacteria 
becoming medicine resistant evolution or is that just an adaption uh, is that simply natural selection as I mean I understand that natural selection is one of the mechanisms of evolution but is that in itself such a small change is that enough to call it evolution because evolution is the uh, change over time change over a long, long period of time where the uh, species has been significantly changed and where uh, many times where the new species won't sexually propagate with the old species and so I think that uh, medicine resistance and that kind of stuff just really doesn't apply to this long scale large term scale of evolution that is needed so that's going to be an interesting class evolution well he talks about in the class <laughs> he talks about uh, how scientists he says if you really want to get in hot water as a scientist and this is another very flat earth relevant uh, topic he says if you want to get in hot water as a scientist just all you have to do is go against the mainline view and he says, yeah, look at what, uh, oh gosh, who was, who was he talking about? Um, well, he talks about the, uh, Vogler, uh, I think that's his name, uh, Vogler that the, that, he, you know, he proposed that, hey, the horse got this molten level and the, um, the continents float upon this and the continents move and shift and change and basically he was proposing plate tectonics right uh, and he says you know they, they called them crazy and look at look at how people accepted Darwin or didn't accept Darwin um, so he's just making the stance that all you have to do is kind of go against the mainline view and all of your uh, co-workers or co-researchers or co-scientists uh, are going to look at you very badly. Well, it was interesting that he brought up plate tectonics. I mentioned to him very quickly at the end of class, I said, hey, uh, I didn't say hey like that. I said, you know, it's interesting you bring up plate tectonics. And he says, why is that? And I said, because it's my view that uh, the plate tectonic theory does not does not work with the globe earth theory and I, I said simply because in the globe earth theory the equator spins a lot faster than at the poles and he kind of nods to that and I said so you know if it's spinning a lot faster on the poles it would you know be like a gyroscope it would uh, It's moving so much faster, those those would propagate. The continents would propagate near to the uh, near to the equator. And you know, that's just an interesting thing. He said, you know, I've never thought of that. And so I'm kind of curious. I'm gonna propose several things to him as we go along. And I'll be curious of his response to them. Um, I think it's pretty important that, you know, I definitely see the signs of plate tectonics. I mean, you know, look at earthquakes, look at uh, things growing and shifting. I mean, that's, that seems kind of obvious. I don't know. Just from what we're told, plate tectonics and volcanoes and all the such seem to be connected. That seems to make sense. But the part that doesn't make sense is the globe, is the earth, is the spinning of the equator. So, I, I just think that's pretty interesting, those views. Um, you know, even scientists themselves, they just haven't really... There's things that haven't crossed our mind because we're just... We're kind of patterned in our thinking and patterned in thinking that things are... We think that things make sense because we haven't taken the time and tried to disprove them yet. But just because we haven't found a way to disprove it doesn't mean that it's truth. Doesn't mean that that gives actual, actual truth. 
So, um, you know, we really must find all theories that contend against it and, uh, you know, try to knock it down. You know, just, just saying, because it hasn't been disproven yet, that's not good enough. Have we tried to disprove it? Have, have you tried to disprove it? If you haven't tried to disprove it, then you're looking at it very biased. So, um, it's just interesting, like I said, very beginning, the European versus the American way, uh, the European way of, oh, we, we need to find the truth, versus the American way of, oh, well, no, this hypothesis works, until they find out that that hypothesis or theory doesn't work. So, um, <laughs> I really loved it, guys. Uh, thanks again. Um, appreciate it.